it's how you live, why you live, and the manner in which you live. How does Oedipus live? He seeks truth. He seeks to help others. Unfortunately, he is human too, and he makes mistakes. What destroys him? Is it fate and out of his control? Is it his hamartia, his anger, his hubris? Hmm. We North Americans are the least fatalistic of people, and we spend most of our lives either denying the entire concept of a fatalistic vision or trying really hard to forget it. And we do that because we are heirs to a tradition, now about 200 years old, which has attempted to deny the existence of fate in this old fashioned sense that we've been talking about. And to insist that human beings must be encouraged to take control of their own lives, to make their own rules, and where necessary, to fight and conquer the given conditions of life, which are not fatal divine presences, we argue, but human problems capable of human solutions. Our most cherished cultural belief is that we can and will eventually win. We have done this by assaulting as much of nature as we can, so as to bring it under human control, so that we are no longer victims of fate, victims of changes in climate, bacterial or viral infections, harvest failures, natural disasters, and we've been in many quarters so spectacularly successful that we're encouraged to think that in only a short time, we've only got a short route to go before we become, as the saying has, has it, masters of our own fate. Despite our attempts to control our lives, everyone here carries a clear fate. And no one has to have a religious sensibility to accept it. That is, each of us carries a biological destiny in our genes, something that is going to control a great deal of what happens to us, no matter what we do, where we were born, when we were born, when and how we die. Still, many of us are extremely confident that we can control our destiny, just like Oedipus. For 200 years, we humans have been hostile about this idea of fatalism, because any notion of fatalism, the sense that the controlling forces of the world are much more mysterious and powerful than we can imagine, it's an uncomfortable reminder that we may be deluding ourselves about our own powers, that what we are up against may be a great deal more complex and unknowable than we can imagine. Severe natural disasters, floods, hurricanes, fires, uh, new outbreaks of massive lethal epidemics. Similar occurrences are often unpleasant reminders that even if we don't like to think about our fate, we may not have put our fate as much under our control as we might wish. This very play, Sophocles' Oedipus the King, is making precisely that point. Like Creon tells Oedipus, is it not time you put your trust in God? So, we've established that Sophocles' society is fatalistic, and ours might be too. Now let's think about what makes a hero in a fatalistic society. It's not simply a hero that is very successful, although he often is, or that he carries out deeds which no one else can carry out, which he frequently does. The hero is more likely to be someone who confronts fate in a very personal manner, and whose reaction to that encounter serves to illuminate our own fatalistic condition like Stuart Scott and his attitude about the blow fate dealt him. Most of us, after all, live in a fatalistic society, but we live in a world in which we don't have to think about it because our communities, our families have educated us to understand the world and has provided stories, rituals, institutions like churches to reinforce our common approach to life. We are all creatures of habit in this respect. And so we don't constantly explore the basis for our belief or have to cope with any challenges to it. And so this story about a hero who challenges or encounters fate and has to respond can force us to confront some basic truths about life and some fundamental assumptions about life. Who does control our life? What sort of relationship do we have with that divine force? We may well prefer not to have to think about this most of the time. Oedipus helps us understand the reasons why our society works the way it does. Our institutions, our beliefs, our rituals, they make it, at least a little bit, understandable, which is something we desire so much. Oedipus is, we recognize right from the start, a great celebrity, a national leader of a city-state at a moment of crisis. 
Thebes has been mysteriously attacked by a plague. <coughs> something which both Oedipus and the citizens see as caused by fate. The citizens are dying and they want, if possible, to stop this disaster. The future of their city depends on it. They naturally turn to Oedipus, their firm and popular ruler. The opening of the play makes at least two things very clear to us. First, the citizens have enormous respect, even love for Oedipus. They acknowledge not only his political power, which they have given to him, but also his preeminence among all human beings for wisdom, especially in dealing with things they don't understand. They say, we judge you, the first of men in what happens in this life and in our interacting with the gods. Second, we see in Oedipus a person of enormous self-assurance and self-confidence, a man who is willing to take on the full responsibility of dealing with this crisis, a task which he clearly accepts as his own challenge. Oedipus has, we observe right from the opening lines, an enormous and powerful sense of his own excellence, his own worth. The most obvious indication of this point is the frequency of the pronouns I and me in all of Oedipus's speeches. The opening also makes clear to us that both the chorus's confidence in Oedipus and his strong sense of his own worth derive from past experience. Oedipus has saved the city before, at a time when many others had tried, he solved the riddle of the Sphinx. So the opening speeches clearly establish our harmonious relationship between ruler and ruled based on past experience. Oedipus's confidence is not merely an illusion. Yes, he has a high regard for himself, but we are given to understand that it is quite deserved and shared by those over whom he rules. And his first step to deal with the crisis that is to send to the oracle for some instructions, are entirely appropriate. Given that fate has brought on the plague, what can fate reveal about its origins? Oedipus has already acted on his own intuitive to address the crisis. And then Oedipus immediately and forcefully proclaims his famous curse against the murderer of Laos, the previous king. All this seems very appropriate. And in fact, it does serve to reassure the people. Their fears were calmed because Oedipus, their king who saved them before, he's taking care of the problem. At the same time, however, the scene gives us our first sense of what becomes inescapable later on. Oedipus, in accepting the responsibility, has no room for sharing the problem with anyone else. As a measure of his own greatness, he will resolve Thebes' distress and he will do it openly for all to see. That's why he can dismiss Creon's suggestion that he listen to the report about the oracle privately first, and why he can definitely declare, then I will start afresh and once again shed light on darkness. He is taking on the task as a personal challenge to be dealt with in his own terms, not by delegating to someone else or by discussing the matter with others, or as we shall see, by listening to what others have to say and acting on their suggestions. How hubris or necessary confidence. Oedipus's determination to deal with the issues himself becomes increasingly evident as the play progresses. Indeed, it becomes his most obvious characteristic. His will to see this matter through on his own terms, no matter what the cost. Is this his hubris? And the more we learn about the ironic net of facts which he is uncovering about the murder, the more we see his determination grow. Even as he becomes increasingly aware of his own possible implications in the death of Laos, his commitment to finding an answer by himself remains strong. Even during the famous argument with Tiresias, Oedipus remains totally committed to himself, completely believing that his conception is truth. By his standard, Oedipus has good reason to be angry with Tiresias and to suspect him, for Tiresias knows the murder of Laos and he won't tell. Oedipus has absolutely no sense that he might be involved at all. And since he has no conception of that as a possibility, he believes it cannot be true. Thus, when Tiresias announces to Oedipus that the accursed polluter of this land is you, Oedipus' interpretation is clear enough. Tiresias must be lying. And he must have reason, a secret agenda. A different man might well stop at this point, calm down, and ask Tiresias what he meant. A different man might have stopped hanging on to his own certainties, confident that they were the truth and have listened carefully to what someone else had to say. But Oedipus is not that sort of person. In fact, rather than listen to Tiresias, 
Oedipus reminds everyone of his previous triumph over the Sphinx, stressing that Tiresias failed to help Thebes then. Is Oedipus too hot-tempered and proud? But remember, Oedipus has every reason to be fully confident that he is not the cursed murderer and confident that he, in his own abilities, can get to the truth and save the city, like he has done before. True, he could be more cautious, more politic here, but if he had those qualities, he almost certainly wouldn't be the king of Thebes in the first place. At the heart of Oedipus's greatness is an enormous and naive self-confidence, and we can be quick to criticize that as a failing and say, no, he is not great. But without his absolute trust in his own power, without his action publicly and quickly, Oedipus would be like the chorus, impotent in the face of crisis, not doing anything. Chorus says, oh, I could wish you'd never come to know. And Iocasta, he could be like Iocasta, just wishing the whole matter would go away. The very thing that we might find lacking in Oedipus's character, is they are the very things that enable him to step up to the front, to make the decisions and to act to meet the crisis. And eventually, let us remember to deal with it since he does find the murderer of Laos, and he does cleanse the city of the plague. Can Oedipus's reputation in action, compared to all of the other characters in action or unwillingness to think through the need for action, can that denounce the criticism that could be made against him about his anger and his arrogance? When Oedipus finally sees the terrible truth of his life, Sophocles hammers home his repeated metaphor about seeing and blindness by having the king stab out his own eyes. Oedipus says he does this because he can no longer look on the horrors that his unwitting actions have created. With this most famous of gougings, Oedipus literally becomes the thing he's always metaphorically been, blind. At the end of the play, Oedipus becomes symbolic of all humanity, stumbling forward, through a dark and unknowable universe. And it is Oedipus's action that leads to his demise. Action against fate, the gods, whatever you want to call it. Sophocles' point is clear. We inhabit a fatalistic world, a rather pessimistic one, and we may not win. Is it not time you put your trust in fate? Our worldview is much more optimistic, usually. However, really bad things happen. How has our Western worldview changed? Do we think about fate in the same way that Sophocles is encouraging us to think about fate? How is it the same? What is your personal view of fate's role in your life? And ultimately, considering the role of fate and the message Sophocles is trying to convey, can you argue that Oedipus is great? If you pity him, if you feel bad for him, yes, he's great. If you don't pity him, if you think he is an arrogant, hot-tempered loser who murdered his father and married his mother and there is no pity for that, then no, he's not great. If you are fearful that you yourself might fall into a similar boat, thinking you can control everything only to discover you can't, then the tragedy might be successful. And yes, Oedipus is great. Lots to think about. I'm curious to hear your thoughts.